to see you. Happy Palm Sunday, church. I am fired up, uh, getting a lot of good feedback from the Evidence Series. I hope you are ready to continue drinking from the fire hose, because we are opening it up full throttle today. I got a lot for you. Get your pens ready, your keypad, your, your pics, if you want to take pictures of the slides. Going to be going to be another awesome, awesome message that the Lord has for us. In Seattle, Washington, I read a story of an airport cargo handler team who was busy unloading pets from the cargo section of the airplane. And things were going along just fine until they got to one particular kennel, and then they discovered that something wasn't quite right. They looked in, and they realized that to their shock and dismay, one of the dogs that they were transporting was now dead. Yeah, right? And they panicked, just like you would. And they didn't know what to do. And to make matters worse, as they looked to the right, coming on the concourse was the owner of that dog headed their way. So they had no time. They quickly huddled together, and they came up with a story that they would tell the owner. And as he approached, they looked up, and they said, Sir, we are so sorry, but apparently your dog has been misrouted to Phoenix. <laughs> okay. So they, uh, here's the lie, right? And then they continued. They said, tell you what, come back tomorrow, and we'll have your dog for you. Not sure what they were thinking. Apparently, their plan was, at the very least, this bought them some time, that they could go around to the local pound, the local dog shelters and pet stores, in a desperate hope that maybe, just maybe, they could find a dog that looked at least remotely similar to the dog that had died. And after searching and searching all through the night into the next day, they finally found one that looked nearly identical to the man's dog, and they brought it back, put it in the kennel, and when they tried to pass it off and give it to the man, he looked at his dog and he said, guys, I don't know. I don't think that's my dog. And they said, oh, no, sir, we understand. It, it, it's your dog. He said, I really don't think it is. He said, nope. Listen, if your dog, if he does look a little different, he just has jet lag, right? It happens, right? And seriously, they're going with it. They're trying to make this story work. And finally, the man leaned in and he peered closely and goes, guys, I really just don't think that's my dog. And this went back and forth for some time. And finally, one of the workers says, sir, why do you keep saying that? How do you know this isn't your dog? To which the man said, because my dog was dead, and I was shipping him back to be buried. Right? <laughs> so things don't normally come back to life. So when they do, it's a big deal. People notice. It's not normal. And 2,000 years ago, we celebrate a man who did something that had never happened before. He overcame death in the grave. There was a few broken-hearted people. They go to the tomb. They're looking for the man they love. They were just going to anoint him with burial spices, and he had recently died. And this is a man who had watched soldiers crucify and, and pierce. And an angel showed up and said, guys, he's not here. He's risen. And the truth of it is he, he wasn't there. It was breaking news. He had risen. The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive. That single fact, that piece of evidence, that news is more important than anything else that has ever happened in the history of mankind. It doesn't matter how big it is. This is the event. I want you to think about this. On that day, when he arrived, when he came, he split time in half. I think we forget how profound it is. Like we even use terms like AD and BC. Remember, BC stands literally for before Christ. And A.D. is the abbreviation for the Latin term Anno Domini, which literally means in the year of our Lord. The full term in Latin is Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, which literally says in the year of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is mentioned by name. There is no mistaking it. Secular, Christian, however you want. The man from Nazareth changed everything. And in this current series, we are investigating the evidence surrounding the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Is he really everything the Bible says he is? So if you're here today and you have honest questions, welcome. If you're here today and you're a skeptic, welcome. If you're listening online and you've got questions, you've got doubts, welcome. You're in good company. It's okay. It is not wrong to have doubts. It's wrong to keep them. Do the groundwork. Do the investigation. Next week, when we talk about Easter, you're going to hear so many reports of investigators who, were, who believed one way, and then after investigating the evidence, they became another way. I was one of those people growing up in a secular NASA household. 
this is how I felt one way. And then God got a hold of me when I started to look at the evidence. So I want you to know it's okay to be skeptical because God can handle our questions. And the Bible can stand up to scrutiny. It can stand up. The evidence, I mean, we'll be honest, the resurrection was unbelievable. By human re reason, it is absolutely unexplainable. But I believe it happened. Not only as a matter of faith, but because the evidence is so overwhelming. Today, we're going to look at the prophecies to begin with, okay? We'll look at the prophecies first about the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And these are prophecies that are so specific, so ridiculously detailed, so precise, and all of them written hundreds of 600, 800 years before Jesus was even born. The evidence is overwhelming. It's almost hard to wrap your head around this. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever asked yourself, how many detailed Specific prophecies were there about Jesus. When I was growing up, I thought, well, you know, there are probably four or five. <laughs> maybe a half dozen, maybe two dozen if we're really like combing into like Isaiah, looking deep. What would, I, what would you think if I told you over 300 prophecies were made about Jesus? Now, guess how many he fulfilled? <laughs> All of them. All of them. Y'all, this is astronomical. Jesus fulfilled every single one. Are you ready to have your faith filled to overflowing? Are you ready to leave edified? Because here we go, drinking from the fire hose, going 80 miles an hour. Rather than give you just one or two of these key verses to start with that we read together, I'm going to give you all of them, <laughs> okay? Not all 300. I'm going to give you my top 20 or so, all right? So you can kind of look here if you want to take a pick and look at the first one. It's Palm Sunday, so I thought we would start there. The first prophecy given about the Messiah says this. He would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. 9. That's exactly what happened. History records this. He would enter the temple, one of the first places you can always find Jesus. He would be betrayed by a friend. Y'all, that's pretty specific in Psalm 41.9. He would be sold for, there's the even exact amount, 30 pieces of, and there's the coin, silver. We even know that denomination. Going further, the silver would later be thrown into the temple. We read that that's exactly what happened. The silver would then be used to buy the potter's field for those who died that were orphans, didn't have family to claim them. He would be forsaken by his own tribe, his disciples, literally. This is, what, this is exactly what happened. Remember Zechariah, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. He would be accused by false witnesses. We looked at the evidence last week. We saw the witnesses came up. They didn't even agree with each other. They were making stuff up. They were trying to come together, and it was almost a laughable uh, trial. We saw the mockery that was happening. Then this last one, he would remain silent before his accusers. All right, so again, if you're new to the faith, I want to point out that these were written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. This is so important because Jesus did not arrive and then retroactively go with his little, you know, notepad and say, now, how can I arrange the details of my death in my 30s to magically coincide with all of these prophecies, right? Because that's exactly what he would have had to do. Some of them were out of his control. These are centuries old prophecies. Keep reading. In Isaiah 53, 5, he would be wounded and bruised. A famous prophecy. Y'all know my favorite band, Striper. This is where they get the name of their band. By his stripes on his back, we are healed. He would be whipped and spat upon. He would be mocked. These are so detailed. His hands and feet would be pierced. A punishment that was not common until this day. Now think about how much into the future, Isaiah, Micah, the psalmist would have to write. He would be crucified with thieves. We know who was on each side of him on the crosses. People would shake their heads at him. Remember that. He was mocked and scorned, and our shame was upon him. His clothes would be divided with lots and casted. If you're not aware of that story, the soldiers at the foot of the cross cast dice to see who would take his garments. Who would get his clothes? It's unbelievable. He would be offered Gall and vinegar to drink. We know that that was put on a sponge and a spear and raised up to him. The exact words of his death cry would be predicted. Not one of his bones would be broken. You know what's amazing about some of these? Jesus has no control over this. He could not fake this if he wanted to. The soldier, when they went to see if he was dead, they're supposed to break the bones on their legs so they can no longer breathe. But instead, they realized he looked dead, they thought he was dead, and he took a spear and rammed it into his side. But... The scriptures were fulfilled. The spear just magically missed and went between two ribs and was able to pierce the pericardium and the lungs and blood and water flow. We read all the medical evidence that Luke talks about. Again, think how ridiculously precise these are. His side would be pierced. 
darkness would fall in broad daylight. We read about that. There was no eclipse on that day, by the way. I, I did a whole message on, on the amazing things that happened uh, from 3 o'clock at noon. He would be buried in a rich man's tomb. We know exactly that's what happened. And then he would be resurrected from the dead. Now, I want you to think about this. I love to make it practical, bring it into today's era. So you can go and talk to your friends and say, guys, there's evidence, there's proof. Here's, it's, it's, it's not just mindless, blind faith. God gives you plenty of proof. Go back 600 years from today. Let's pick a historical event. How about this one? In 1492, Columbus sailed what? The ocean blue. You all remember that? You grew up as a little nursery rhyme that kind of teaches about this. Think about this. To give us a reference, let's go back 600 years and assume Christopher Columbus, let's just say he's a prophet now, and he is going to write about things today with such ridiculous accuracy and precision. It would be as if he would say, in the year 2023, I foresee a church shall sprout forth in the Carolinas of the north, specifically in a town that is the peak of high price, a peak of good living. <laughs> the name of the church shall come forth from the hand of the potter. Let's get even more specific. And thine chairs shall be charcoal gray. The pastor's head shall be balding. Okay, that's just five. But be honest. We came today across a document and opened it, and it said those five prophecies, we'd lose our mind. We would run around and freak out and say, what was that? you got to be kidding me. How does he do that, right? That's just five prophecies. Now, add to that another 295 specific prophecies, and you see this cannot be random. This is not an accident. This is the plan of an awesome divine hand. The Lord knew what he was doing. It's a staggering amount of evidence and proof. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this. He says, I am God's son. I love this. But don't believe me unless I do the works of my father. So Jesus, is, he's essentially throwing down the gauntlet. He's giving you permission to test him. He's saying, guys, I will further prove to you that I am God's son. I'm going to do miraculous works, not on my own, but on behalf of my heavenly father. And to top it all off, perhaps the most miraculous of them all, he raises from the dead. Unbelievable. But when I was lost and I didn't know the Lord and I was still doubting this, this seems so far-fetched, so bizarre. So, you know, the, the, historically, how is this even? But the prophecies alone caught my attention. This is exactly what history records, and we're just scratching the surface. Now I want us to move from the prophecies to the evidence of the eyewitnesses. Because I ran out of time last week, and I would only briefly touch on what uh, we, we looked at. So look at 1 Corinthians 15 with me. And I want you to notice what Paul writes. This is Paul now. He says this. For what I received, I passed on to you as of what? First important. Okay, this is primo. This is it. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. And then to the 12, and then after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Now get this, most of whom are still alive, though a few of them have fallen asleep. Then Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to Paul, to me also. Now the reference to 500 people most of whom were still living when, when Paul wrote this letter. This is basically just his way of sealing the argument. If you're familiar with law, this is the right hook. This is what he wants to leave the jury with. This is Paul making a statement saying, guys, it is so easy for people to refute me. Any one of you could come up and say, that's not true, that didn't have you did except for the fact that these 500 people, not one of them came forward and refuted it. So Paul's basically saying, guys, you can go and check. People are very quick to rebuke a, a preacher or somebody online or Paul. They would come up and they would say, listen, I have doubts. That's not true. That's not what happened. They could throw down a challenge to him. There's plenty of other people around, though. Paul says, you can check it out with them. So Paul is laying his credibility on the line saying, if you don't believe me, why don't you ask this huge crowd of people, most of whom are still alive, you can go to their house and you can talk to them. Now, skeptics, prosecuting attorneys would love to try to take this apart by dropping the word bias. This is where a lot of people wonder, how can this stand up? If you were a prosecuting attorney, if you're a skeptic, naturally you would say, hey, 
aren't all these witnesses biased? What do we do about the bias? How can you really trust it? They can't possibly be unbiased in this. All right, so let's go there. We ain't scared. Let's look at this. I want you to think, we just finished March Madness, all right? Picture your team. Is your team up there? No, my team's not up there, but my team didn't last long either. So when you look at this, I want you, let's just say that um, you're an NC State fan or a Duke fan, and you are playing against Carolina, and it's the national championship, and you hear whispers that, hey, did you hear that head coach Hubert Davis of Carolina is actually going to be allowed to be the head referee of this game? Did you hear about that? Would you think that's a little fishy? And then, to your horror, you're dribbling, you're doing your warm-ups, you're draining the threes, and you look over, and sure enough, Hubert Davis is taking off his Carolina blue, and he's putting on a black and white stripe uniform, and he grabs a whistle, and he bebops into the center of the court and says, play ball. He can't possibly be unbiased. There's no way he could call a fair game, right? Immediately, we have doubts. And so I get that. There's okay. Let's, let's take it. God can handle that. There's three reasons why we want to look closely at this. The first one, if you're looking at the disciples and their bias, just because the disciples were followers of Jesus doesn't mean they were inaccurate historians. Think about that. They could still write down events. They could still write down events that were historically accurate. Being a follower of Christ and being an accurate writer of history are not mutually exclusive. I am so tired of people of faith and Christians being mocked as mindless idiots, as if we cannot be smart, educated, and have a brain, too. Being a Christian and being smart are not mutually exclusive. Being a follower of Christ does not mean you cannot record history accurately. The second thing we see is one of the greatest archaeologists who ever lived, the original Indiana Jones, was this man right here, Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. He was so gifted that he was made the prestigious very first professor of archaeology at Oxford. Oxford University, okay? No lightweight, no little amateur hour here. This is the real deal. And he was a skeptic. In fact, he made it known audibly, my life's work is to disprove the writings of the Bible. I want to come again. I, my job is to refute them. So in his elite legal mind, his archaeology background, he chose a target. Guess who he picked? He said, I am going to target the most respected and credible writer of the New Testament, Luke. Why Luke? Anybody remember what Luke's profession was? Absolutely. He was a doctor, a well-read, educated, respected, detail-driven physician. And if you ever read his writings and you read into Acts, that's exactly what shows up in his writings. So Dr. Ramsey said, after years of study and scrutiny, his world began to implode. And the professor of Oxford became overwhelmed with evidence. He started to be stunned by the accuracy of the scriptures. And then finally, much to the chagrin of his colleagues, he came forward and made this public statement. He said, the scriptures can bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority of the facts for the Aegean world. Okay, that's all over by Judea. And that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and perception of truth that it is a model of historical statement. Think about that. This is, this is a skeptic. He would then go on to say about Luke, you can press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian of that time, and they still stand up to my keenest scrutiny and my harshest treatment. Remember, this is no friend of Christianity. The third reason, though, is probably my, my favorite, and this is where we'll park the, the most here. The New Testament tells us there were six verified, independent testimonies to the fact of the resurrection. Three of them were eyewitnesses. Okay? We know John, Peter, and Matthew. Later, we know Paul, writing to the early churches, began to refer to the resurrection in such a way that it was obvious and that it was a well-known fact to his readers. It was never in question. This was accepted without question. It was common knowledge even in that day. And the evidence for the resurrection, resurrection was, was universally known, okay? So we need to know that. This wasn't just a group of people running around like a little conspiracy group with tinfoil hats. They were legitimately known throughout, right? So to not believe the eyewitnesses, we have to assume every single one of these men were pathological liars. To not believe us, we have to understand every single one of them are deluded con men. There's no way. It's far too improbable. They have everything to lose by holding to the resurrection. Think about that. Do you know how the disciples ended? 
We're going to get to that in, in just a second. So I got to ask, what was it that changed this group of frightened, discouraged, depressed followers into fearless people who held to their convictions to the end? What was it that replaced Thomas's doubt with a deep, unshakable faith that went with him to the grave? You'll see in just a minute how Thomas actually ended. What was it that changed Peter from being a coward around a fire, being bullied by a little girl into denying Jesus, to being Peter the courageous? What happened was they saw the evidence. They saw the proof. Their lives were changed. One minute, they're defeated. Now they're fearless. They were crushed. Now they're confident. One minute, they're having a pity party. The next minute, that party changes, and they're taking on the world. They're dancing until the sunlight cracks. It just gives me shivers. It's crazy. When you think about what happens next, John Stott has the most incredible quote because I, res I respect John Stott so much, but this is where it all hangs for me. This is what helped lead me. He said this quote here, perhaps the most and powerful thing, the transformation of the disciples is the greatest evidence of all the resurrection. Think about that. Perhaps the greatest thing is what the disciples did when Jesus came back to life. See, we forget how they really felt. Let me ask you this question. Go back. What was it? What was their initial reaction to the disciples when they heard the news about the death of Jesus and the crucifixion? Were they happy? Were they confident? Were they running around going, it's no big deal. We know he's coming back. Woohoo! We got a party. We just, just, just give it three days. They weren't that way at all. They were, they, they fled. They were so down, so out. They bailed on him. You don't bail on your leader if you're certain he's coming back. Put yourself at work. When you're at work and you're working and your boss is there and you watch him and he steps out for a while, you don't check out and go home early if you know he's coming back at 445. See what I'm saying? You stick around. Think about them. Peter goes back to his old way of life. Peter goes back to fishing. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm going fishing. My fishing buddy's like, what's wrong with that? Right? That's... Mary comes to the tomb holding something very unique, spices. You don't bring spices to anoint somebody who's alive. Not one of us come in here with our spice can and start throwing it around like pixie dust, saying, <laughs> you bring spices to anoint a dead body. Every one of them still expected this. Scripture says that actually when Mary showed up, she mistook him for the gardener. Said, Excuse me, sir, if you know where you've taken him, will you just let me know so that I can go and be with him? When the other disciples heard the, the news that the first eyewitnesses were starting to come back, they didn't believe him. When Jesus finally did appear to the disciples, their first reaction wasn't joy, it was fear. You remember that? They didn't even, they said, it's a ghost. And Jesus had to literally say, guys, chill. Fear not. That was his first word, not chill, but his first word, repeat, don't be afraid. And he says, you see, I have, I have skin and bones. He actually literally goes on, he says, give me something to eat. Mmm, and he eats in front of them. How cool is that? That the Savior comes back from the dead and cooks these guys breakfast. That is a Savior who says, I'm the real deal. Come, remove your doubts. And finally, the one disciple that stands out to me above them all is Thomas. This man gets such a bad rap. How would you like to forever be called Doubting Thomas for one event? Or Doubting Your Name for one event? Would you like that to forever be memorialized? I don't think it's a fair thing. In fact, just one quick search pulls up joke after joke after joke about Thomas. And I don't think this is, these are very fair to him. Doubting Thomas? Mm, how about a disciple who had some questions and then went on to change the world? Went on to India and planted the church there. And it is growing like a weed to this day because of Thomas. Because a man who said... My God and my Lord. In fact, look at the scriptures here. This is incredible. Starting in John 20, here's, this, here's what happened. After eight days, his disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them. And Jesus came in, the door still being shut. Okay, so he comes straight into their midst. Boom, didn't come through the doors. He appears, and again, they're going to be scared. So what's his words? Peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, come here, boy. Reach your fingers here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Talk about the, the spear wound here. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. 
Check out what happens next. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and believe. He's whispering through the centuries. This applies to you and me. We've not seen it. We've not beheld it by being able to touch his flesh and his bones, watch him eat fish in front of us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. I want to see something really cool here. Look at this passage. I want you to notice, what is the Lord's demeanor in this interaction? What is the Lord's reaction to Thomas's doubt? I love it. Jesus never rebukes Thomas for his doubts or his questions. He simply answers him with gentleness and love. He gives him permission to come feel the wounds for himself. Guys, this is what sets our Savior apart from the rest of the false gods. What an awesome Savior that allows his followers to seek him out, to be honest, to open up, to ask the questions. Jesus meets us right where we are. You know what this shows us? That God can handle our doubts, that God will meet us where we are. He can handle the questions. So bring them to him. I'm talking to somebody. You've been wrestling with doubts. You've been on the fence. Have no fear. Bring them to the Father. Think about what Thomas did. That's exactly what he did. Tell him what's on your heart. He goes on to serve God in such a powerful way that he dies a martyr's death over in India, planting this church that, by the way, revival is sweeping that continent. You're not going to hear it in the news. But by the thousands, people are coming to faith in Christ in India. Keep your eye on that nation. The church is there because of a man who was labeled a doubter. I don't know about you, man, but that gives me hope. That is amazing. What a committed follower. He asked a question, but then he goes on to bear a ton of fruit. What about us? This brings me to the 500 witnesses. This brings me to the belief in the resurrection that spread like wildfire, to the timid fishermen. But it brings me to how they ended. Timid fishermen tax accountants, shepherds who were once fearful are suddenly and radically changed. So much so that they refuse to back down on their claims even upon threat of death. They refuse to back down on their claims so saying, I saw Christ rise from the dead. It would have been so easy for them to have done that. But if they continue to hold to this claim that he was indeed risen from the dead, they faced horrific torture. Did you know that? Some of these martyrs died with deaths that, honestly, they're hard to read. Every single one of them, with the exception of, of John, who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos and died alone and old over there, all of them were killed for standing for the resurrection. Why? Because they knew it was real. It would have been so easy for them to say, guys, Maybe we should back off on this resurrection thing. They're talking about taking off our heads. Guys, maybe we should back off on this. You know, maybe we should just go back to fish and just lay low. Maybe we all had a group hallucination. They didn't. All 12 of them stood by their statement. Now, to illustrate the absurdity that the disciples were in on a hoax, in just a second, we're going to play a video that just came out. Many of you are familiar with the Babylon Bee and how... Perfect is the timing that they released a video just this weekend that deals with the disciples and what they would have to go through, the pretzel contortions they would have to do in order for this to be fake, in order for this to be a hoax, or for them to be in on, or to steal the body, or to dismiss the evidence. And I want to give you a heads up. It is sheer lunacy and absurdity. And it's okay to laugh because it is hysterical with what they have to do in order to perpetrate this hoax. All right, it's just a little over three minutes, and then I'll come back, and I'll, I've used all my time. We'll, we'll end with that. So go ahead, brother. You can dim the lights. I want you guys to watch this, how the disciples handled a possible hoax. I need 100% participation for this to work. Yeah, everyone's here. All 12, 11, 11 of us. Well, what's the plan? Well, as you know, Jesus is dead. But stick with me, stick with me, okay? Stick with me. I have a plan. We are going to steal his body. Okay, okay, I'm tracking with you. What's next? And then we're going to tell the whole world 
that you rose from the dead. Oh, <laughs> oh you know I'm in. I love it already. <laughs> all right, classic, classic, then what? And then? We're all going to get brutally murdered. Oh! Wait, 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 come again, come again. Could you go over that last part real, real quick? Oh, what? We get murdered. What's the problem? Uh, I, I like it. I like it. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, Peach. I love me a good hoax as much as the next guy, right? Right? Uh, oh, what's in it for us? Do we all get riches, fame, and fortune first, right? No, no, get this. You're going to be hated, persecuted, and reviled for the rest of your life! something here, right? Okay? I mean, why on earth would we do this? Can, can we start over? Oh, okay. We'll start from the beginning. Everybody, for John, yeah. the beloved disciple. So, okay. <laughs> we go down to Jesus' tomb. It sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Then, we pay off the Roman soldiers that are guarding the tomb with their lives. Why, check, why would they do that? Hey, we <laughs> somehow roll away the big stone that's in front of the tomb. Obviously, you have to move the rock first. Yeah. And then we steal his body. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess. Then we tell the whole world that he rose from the dead, and we get brutally murdered for our troubles. <laughs> Then we all get killed. Come on. When do we see ourselves become exalted and praised? That's just it. You don't. Oh, yes. Have I got good news for you? Because we know that's exactly what happened. Do you see the insanity? Do you see the lunacy? For people to believe that every one of these God fearing men participated in a hoax and take this to their deaths to live for a lie is insanity. So our time is up. Here's what I want us to do I want you to take away this. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, it's as if he's appearing to us saying, You no longer have to go through life doubting anymore. You no longer have to go through life wondering what your purpose is. I am here. You don't have to doubt about God. You don't have to doubt about the Lord. You can live with faith, hope, and purpose. So today is Palm Sunday. We've looked at a staggering amount of evidence. I hope that it has edified you. I hope that it has bolstered your faith and given you a fresh reminder of all that the Lord has gone through. Because when we leave this place, we're not supposed to leave that here. Now our job is to take it out there. So the challenge I issued a couple weeks ago was one person that you're praying for. Who is it that needs to hear the evidence of the gospel? Who is it that needs to hear the truth, that there is a God who loves him, that he cares, and that redemption is possible? I pray that God has laid somebody on your heart. Remember, there's that great stat, eight out of ten people who hear an invitation from somebody accept it during this season. It's a season of the soul. Their hearts are more open. The, the, the ground is more fertile. I pray that we will be found faithful during the season to share the good news. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for that person that's on our heart, for the lost person. Continue to pray for Ghana, our missionaries, as they wrap up 
cannot wait to hear all that God has done through them. They fly home in a couple days. So keep praying for them and pray for our lost family members and friends to come to know the Lord. Let's bow together. Father, you are so good. I thank you that you have overwhelmed us with evidence. It's, it's more than just even a matter of faith, Lord. It just, it, it's so clear what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just sit on that knowledge, that we wouldn't hide our light under the bushel, but we would take it outside these walls to a lost and hurting world. God, for that one person that you put on our mind, we pray now, we lay them before your throne and ask that you soften their heart. I pray that the scales covering their eyes to the truth would fall. We pray against any spiritual darkness that is trying to distract them or to continue to keep them down and distracted and oppressed. Pray that you would shine through, Lord. Use us. Use this week as we focus on your passion and the holy things that you did all throughout this week. God, may we celebrate newness of life this coming Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. Put that person in our path. Give us the boldness to speak out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Happy Palm Sunday. Have a great week. I will see you on Resurrection Morning.